I was fast asleep. I heard a man's voice. Paul! And I sat up abruptly. He scared me to death. I reached over to the bedside table where my Glock lay. Paul, it's me, Dan. Sorry to wake you up like that, but we have an emergency. Dan. Dan, who is Dan? Uh, Dan Jenkins? He runs Doris's office here in town. Dan, why the hell are you in my bedroom? I have a phone. I have a doorbell. I couldn't use the phone and didn't want to be seen at the door. We have a really big problem and we need to talk. Dan, I only have one problem. Some idiot decided to wake me up. I looked at the alarm clock at 2.45 in the fucking morning. I regret it, but it could cost the senator his chance to become president. It's bigger than you or me. Dan, get out of my bedroom. Get out of my house. If you don't, I'll do one of the following. I'll shoot you and call 911, or I'll call 911 and tell you you're here to cover up some political blunder, or I'll just physically kick your ass. And let me explain why you were found beaten and bloody on my front lawn. He took a couple of steps back, which was a tactical mistake, allowing me to draw my gun. I pointed it at him. Hey, hey, wait a minute, don't shoot. Dan, last chance. Turn around and run to the door. I probably won't shoot. You have 60 seconds to get out. If you don't, I'll kill you and tell 9 to 1 1 that I shot an intruder. Since you will be dead, you will have no arguments. But this, 55, 54, 53. For some reason, Dan decided that my wife's potential political career was worth less than his life and made a hasty retreat. I wondered how long it would take him to call her team and how long it would take her team to call me. I was coming to my senses. You know the difference between being awake but drooling and being able to string two thoughts together. A damn inconvenient time to start the day. But I got up, went to the toilet, then showered, just quickly rinsed off. I was drying myself, and then my phone rang. Yes, I said without emotion. Paul, this is John Schmidt, Senator. John. I'll interrupt because I don't want to talk to you or your assistant or the deputy secretary of the interior or the president or anyone else. If the senator you're talking about has a problem, she should call me directly. I'm afraid this is impossible. Oh my God, let me clarify. Was she hurt in any way? Well, not physically, but you see, John, it was very nice to talk to you. If my wife wants to ask me something, let her call. If you would like to speak with me, please call my office and make an appointment. I think I'll have some time in six or seven weeks. I passed out. In less time than it would have taken me to compose a text, my phone beeped, and I looked at the message from John. Please do not allow the press to talk to you before you have spoken to the senator. It took me a little longer to answer. John, you're dreaming. If my wife wants to talk to me before the press gets to me, then time is ticking. I'm not going to hide like some thief. Being the husband of a successful politician is an interesting role in life. I must say that my wife is an outstanding politician. She can speak in front of any audience and win them over to her side. Our state is truly purple when it goes one way in some elections and the other way in others. Doris Russell, my wife, was liked by the majority of voters not only in our state but also nationally. There was serious talk that she could become a presidential candidate in this or the next election. I am the owner of a successful investment company. Right now, we are having great success raising money from various sources to fund startups. This is a high-risk investment, but I can predict success, at least often enough that buying our portfolio produces extraordinary returns. The downside, if there is one, is that I am tied to our offices and travel frequently to evaluate companies seeking our financial support. I'll say this. It is very difficult to maintain anything resembling a normal marriage when both parties are extremely successful. The possibility of children became the first casualty. In my opinion, they need parents who are involved in their young lives. I knew I wasn't up to the task, and Doris told me that if we had children, we would both have to take a step forward. We easily agreed that children were not our priority. The real challenge is maintaining any kind of partnership. You'd think that when she was elected as a senator and moved to Washington, D.C., it would be a big deal, but it wasn't. She could come home often to be with constituents, and I could go there for long weekends whenever I wanted. 
In any case, sometimes we didn't see each other for a week. We're both 38, got married at 25, and we're both on our way to success by then. Being able to talk to someone who doesn't judge you and is only seeking to understand is very important. It is equally important to give advice to someone who may be leaning in the wrong direction and in a way that is perceived as an attempt to help. And of course, there is the purely animal attraction, celebrating victories or forgetting defeats, aggressively between the sheets. This is another way to grow together. But now you're in your 30s, your work demands are increasing, and suddenly your body demands sleep, at least from time to time. Something has to give. And slowly but surely, it turns out to be a partnership. Doris and I swore to each other that we wouldn't let that happen, as if we can stop the rain. What really pissed me off was the nature of politics. If approximately 60% of people think something is bad, a good politician must learn to either agree or instead mumble something inaudibly. Over time, she tried to convince herself that this was better than that, even though I knew she thought just the opposite, and my advice was making her life more difficult. Although she agreed with me, she had to object because it was the right political move. We fundamentally disagreed. I believed her best political future was to be herself. She was told that her chances would be better if she took the right side on less important issues. Her manager, or whatever he called himself, began to gain more and more of her attention. The first big fight happened about two months ago when she accused me of trying to sabotage her because I didn't agree with one of John's shitty opinions. I told her that if she thought John was more on her side than I was, then we had a problem. Have you ever said something and really regretted it? She heeded my words and believed. I wanted her to understand that we were partners, and John was leading her astray, and she heard that we had problems. So this morning, when I was attacked by some idiot on her staff, I knew it was a tentacle from a conversation about how we were in trouble. I wasn't going to hear it from them, I was going to hear it from her. My phone rang, Doris's ringtone. Good morning, I said, without meaning it. Why is it so difficult with you? Doris, my instinct is to hang up. What makes you think that it's difficult with me? John told me. Yeah, now you'll tell me why John thinks it's difficult with me. Fuck, John. Fine, you are right. I have a problem and John convinced me that it would be better if he explained it. It's clear. Talking to me now? Would you say John was right? No, probably not. Okay. Now tell me what this big problem is. It wasn't like that between us. You know. She paused. Wanted confirmation? Not from me. We used to rely on each other. Now more often than not, John gives me the best advice. I rely on him more and more. Silence, I was silent too, waiting for what she would say. I decided that this was her hole, let her dig further. There's no easy way to say it. John and I fell in love. So far, nothing surprising. Although falling in love was disappointing, silence seemed like the best option to me. We were caught this evening, in Bethesda. We decided it was far enough away and were having dinner in a public place when some reporter caught us kissing. He somehow took a photo of us undressing each other as we entered my room. He let us know what he had. The story will be revealed in the morning. We must get ahead of him. You do not care? Don't you want to say anything? You speak in declarative sentences. I understood what you said. You didn't ask me anything. Are we really that far apart from each other? Once upon a time, you loved me. I still love you. I am not the one who reports that I have fallen in love with someone else. All I can say is that I'm sorry. I'm even more sorry that I have to ask for your help to get through this crisis. My help? Are you kidding? No, I take it back. This is the new you. The legend is more important than the facts. By the way, what kind of legend is this? John thinks we can turn this to my advantage. There is such a double standard. Men can have affairs, women cannot. You and I can stand in front of the press and say... This happens, I'm sorry, and you forgive. We can embellish it a little, make it part of our relationship, which we say remains strong. And this is so? I asked sarcastically. What is it? Is our relationship still strong? Well, that's the point. We remain married, but there will be no relationship between us, if you know what I mean. 
No, and don't try to explain it. You want John? Great. I bless you both. If you want to get married, fine. I will try to forgive you. But I'll make sure you and John stay in the past. Your choice. I heard muffled conversation. Do you wonder what's going on in people's heads? My wife and I are trying to figure out if we want to stay married and she needs to discuss this with her lover. Divorce will ruin me. I'll give up on John. Fire him. Today, I said in my best uncontested voice. Even more muted conversation. No. Then I'll apply in the morning. Another muffled conversation. Fine. This is all? No, this is a condition for us to start. We're going to work with a psychologist and see if we can save our marriage. You are the one who lives in a world of political fantasy. If we want to be married, we will keep this in mind. If you can't do it, then accept the consequences. Her tone changed. I've always loved you. You are right. Living a lie will never work. I'm so sorry. Can you ever forgive me? Doris, I'll be honest with you. As always, I have my doubts. It's intoxicating, you know. Here together your name and the position of President of the United States. Muffled conversation again. Sorry, I asked John to leave. His strategies carried my name so far. I lost my head. I'm sorry. How long ago? Since we quarreled. I decided that being president was more important than being married. Obviously, one cannot be done without the other. This is a ringing confirmation. This is the best I can do now. Give me a chance. I convinced myself that everything was over between us, but it was wrong, and I knew it. John convinced me that I couldn't have the presidency and you, and he convinced me that I should actually let you go. As I said, these are his strategies. This is the delirium of a madman. As I told you from the very beginning, we talked a little. We agreed that she would fire John publicly. In the morning, well, morning for everyone else, it was still a little less than four o'clock in the morning. She will say that they made a mistake and her marriage is too important to her. She also said that she and I would be speaking to the press within the next week. All the morning news ended with Doris and John groping each other outside her hotel room. This was great political news. Within the next hour, it was announced that Senator Russell would make a public announcement at 9 a.m. Doris came out dressed professionally and said she would read a prepared statement and then answer questions. Last night I made a big mistake, which I now regret. My campaign manager and I became too close, and we let it slip out of our control. My political career is important. My marriage is more important. This morning I fired the head of my company. I also spoke with my husband, offered him my deepest apologies, and we agreed to do everything we could to restore our wonderful marriage. We will speak to you in the coming days. I will answer your questions. How long did this affair last? It was not a novel. This was a one-time mistake. Why fire John Schmidt? Even though the mistake was mine, John and I crossed the line. That happens. I'm not proud of it, but I'm not alone either. When you make a mistake, you need to prove that you won't make the same mistake. This meant that John and I had to separate. So, don't you trust yourself? Yes, I trust myself. At this point, my husband has legitimate reasons to doubt me. One way to prove to him that it was a mistake is to fire John, Mr. Schmidt. He is an extraordinary talent. He will get on his feet. The questions continued. She handled them well. They became less and less sharp. It was clear that she was winning over the audience. It was Wednesday morning. I needed to work. We needed to work. We have decided that our public announcement will be made on Monday morning. I pushed for Friday, but it's a bad day for the news cycle. You looked good at the morning interview. With a good follow-up interview, I think you'll be fine. I hope so. I worked so hard, she replied. Find us a consultant in Washington. I will be there as often as necessary. Fine. I will also work on our application. The application seemed more important to her than the consultant. Perhaps this is natural, since she is probably competing for the main prize in the world. Can I make my own? My question was more of a test than a sincere desire. I'd prefer it polished, if you don't mind. Will you do it yourself? By using. You know, I'm surrounded by word merchants. 
When will you appear in the city? I have a busy week. I don't think I can get there before Monday morning. Why don't you schedule a press conference for noon? This will give me time to prepare. My independent work went as I expected. Monday came quickly. I flew to Washington on our company plane and arrived at 7 Salam. Doris's staff were already there to meet me. We quickly arrived at her apartment. We kissed at the door. Oh, I love you so much, she said. I love you even more, I returned. Here's your script. Let me know what you think. I read it. I had to admit that it sounded real, sincere enough, emotional enough, and with real hope that we could live our lives as the loving couple we had always been. My remarks should have followed hers. Good afternoon. Today I brought my husband of 13 years to report on our progress since last week. I'm glad to say we have a strong marriage that can overcome my indiscretions. We will be seeing a counselor twice a week for a while until we figure out everything we need to do to repair our relationship. She talked about it for a long time. She explained her mistake and how she repented. It was very impressive. After almost ten minutes, she asked me to say a few words. Unfortunately, for our presentation today, I did a little homework myself. I regularly use private investigators to make sure startups are what they say they are. I organized discreet surveillance of the senator and her lover. She could fire him, but he remained her lover. He snuck into her apartment after midnight on Thursday, or rather, on Friday morning. He never left, and I wondered where he was hiding while we were working on the presentation. I always didn't like political theater. When I said this, her eyes became big. This was not part of my script. My wife and I made several agreements to save our marriage. Unfortunately, she didn't follow through on any of them, and today I'm here to announce that I've filed for divorce and she'll get it after this this, what should I call it, representation. I will be happy to answer any questions. There was a stunned silence. To her credit, she's unperturbed. I cannot believe this. Political dirty trick. My husband never intended to take me back and put me through this mess. I smiled and left. Several reporters asked me questions, which I answered honestly. Who knows how much honesty will hold up against political truth?